Um, so as you already heard a little bit, um, we are from Mount Horn, Wisconsin. Um, our school has done the XMAS program two times previously um, with Dr. Prissel uh, as our advisor. Um, and so this group is kind of piloting a new kind of extension type of research to potentially do looking at a um, moon emission concept study. So I will let them kind of tell you about the research they did. So at the very beginning of the year, we talked with our advisor for this project, Dr. Pascal Lee, and he gave us kind of two options of what to do for our research. We could either plan, build, and site a base camp within Philolaus Crater, or we could plan a data collection mission to a set of candidate pits also within Philolaus Crater. Um, our research is based off the latter of the two options. We planned a robotic data collection mission for 2027. When planning our mission, we worked very closely with Dr. Pascal Lee, as mentioned before, Dr. Brian Day, and the MoonTrack software team from JPL. With their help, we utilized MoonTrack to do most of our research and planning for this mission. We made lots of analyses, we looked at graphs, we used the tools within the program, and even tools that are not yet released in the program, but are kind of in beta testing. We spent most of the year planning the mission and the last few months writing a paper outlining our mission and the tools used to complete it. This poster that we're about to present is based off that paper that we wrote. Yeah. And then for some background, um, Mount Cypher is a proposed mission to Philolaus Crater, which is a high latitude crater on the near side of the moon. Um, the rock there is from the Copernican age, meaning it's about 1.1 billion years old, so relatively new. Um, and then on this crater, many sinuous rills have been identified. And along these sinuous rills are a lot of dark, permanently shadowed regions which have been interpreted as partially collapsed areas of the rills, and we call these candidate pits. Um, since they're at such high latitudes, the floor of these pits would never be exposed to sunlight, meaning the temperature is very low, as low as 23 degrees Kelvin. And due to these extremely low temperatures, volatiles could be cold trapped if they entered these pits, um, and these volatiles could include H2O ice. So our primary objectives for this mission included entering and exploring Canada pits in the eastern region of Philolaus Crater, obtaining imagery and collecting data, measuring and measuring volatiles, such as the possible H2O ice. All of this would help provide future insight into Mars missions, as if H2O ice was present in these candidate pits, it could possibly use, be used for fuel sources, for a fuel source to use the water as a fuel source for rockets to get back to Earth, or it could be used for water to support a base camp on those both on the moon. And then having water on, in these candidate pits could also support evidence of H2O um, on Mars in similar candidate pits. So our main three levels of objective were then our threshold mission, meaning the mission, the what we needed to have occur for the mission to even be viable would be to explore at least and get data from at least one candidate pit. Then our baseline mission, basically what we hope to ask happen would be to explore two candidate pits. And then our extended mission, if everything was going very well and we had time left, we would explore the, more than two candidate pits and collect data from them all. Um, and then moving on to science payload, um, two proposed robotic devices will work in tandem to complete this mission. A Viper class rover, Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, um, and Globetrotter. So for Viper, um, this is a rover that was designed for NASA's Artemis mission. Um, where it will explore the moon's south polar region near Millwild Crater in 2023. Um, our mission will employ a Viper class rover, which means it will have comparable functioning and instruments as the original uh, Viper rover design. Um, and this rover will carry several instruments for data collection during this mission. Um, one of these, the Neutron Spectrometer System, also known as uh, NSS, is an instrument that can detect variation in neutrons while traversing the moon's surface. Um, this device can then use this information to identify hydrogen atoms in H2O. Um, if NSS detects an abundance of hydrogen, the near-infrared volatile spectrometer system, a, aka NERVIS, can be used to determine the nature of this hydrogen. If it is H2O, O2, or OH, or um, hydrogen atoms. NERVIS can also detect many other organic compounds as well. Um, Next, the omnidirectional color camera, Occam, will be employed to take 360 degree red, green, blue photographs of the environment. In addition, Viper operates on a waypoint system, can traverse over lands with slopes of up to 15 degrees, 
travels an average of 0.4 kilometers per hour, um, can reach speeds of up to 0.72 kilometers per hour, and it is powered by a solar charged battery. Viper will also be carrying the hopper rover known as Globetrotter to collect data from within the candidate pits. This data will be sent through radio waves using a small antenna um, and will be relayed back to the Earth by Viper utilizing an X band DTE by way of the Deep Space Network. Um, then our second proposed robotic device is Globetrotter. Um, this is a concept um, by Dr. Pascali for a robotic hopper that could navigate the moon's surface and enter candidate pits. Um, this is ideal due to its unique travel method of hopping from point to point, which allows it to traverse more extreme, extreme terrains than traditional rovers. A cold gas dust is used to begin the preliminary bounce, and the globe trotter is in free fall until it collides at the surface and is airborne again. Each consecutive bounce decreases in duration and distance by 33%, resulting in each thrust propelling the hopper approximately 142 meters. Um, the average speed of this robotic hopper is about one kilometer per day, um, and Globetrotter's payload will also include Occam, uh, along with LED lights for illumination within the candidate pits to take uh, photographs, um, as well as NSS and nervous systems for volatile prospecting and analysis. Lastly, this uh, robotic hopper will utilize accelerometers, which will allow Globetrotter to record information on its movement and position. So the Mount Cypher mission is planned to be about 14 days at longest and it will occur from April 17th to May 1st of 2027, theoretically. This would avoid the lunar night, which would be very bad for Viper and for Globetrotter to be caught in. <laughs> so the landing site is in, in, in an area of impact flow, and it is 4.12 kilometers approximately away from the candidate pits that we are interested in. So Viper would carry Globetrotter on it for most of the traverse from the landing site to the Canada pits. And for it would take about six to seven days to arrive at a, what we call the separation point. And this is a point where it would become, the terrain gets a bit rocky and a bit difficult for Viper to traverse through. So this is where Viper would continue about a kilometer in a separate direction from Globetrotter where Globetrotter would be able to use its thrusters to get across the more difficult regions of land. So then Globetrotter would take about one to two more days to go approximately 1.5 kilometers to the actual candidate pits, where it would then do a survey over bounce when it arrived to collect initial data of the pits. It would then bounce into the pits and would remain in them for a maximum of two hours. But in reality, we are planning for by for Globetrotter to be in the pit for just one hour to be safe because these are permanently shadowed regions and Globetrotter couldn't be in it for more than two hours because of the cold and having no light to recharge. So it would be in there for one hour to be safe. But while in the pit, Globetrotter would collect all of its data and take images to the best of its ability. Then it would bounce out of the pit and it would find an area with good lighting so it could send, so it could charge as well as send its data over to Viper, which will have arrived at a set location about a kilometer away or so which so it can receive data. Then if there is time and if the both devices are still working well, Globetrotter will go into a different candidate pit and collect more data. It will continue to do so until it is unable to get any more data or the lunar night occurs. Okay, and then just final outro um, and acknowledgements for help in this research. So in general, we're a team of mostly juniors and one senior from Mount Herb High School. We have a fifth member who's not present today. Unfortunately, he's sick. Um, but we are all grateful for this wonderful opportunity to do this research and work with um, our project advisors from JPL and NASA. Um, some of those advisors that we want to mention specifically are Dr. Lee and Brian Day along with the entire Moontrack software team from JPL. Um, and one last final thank you goes to Ms. Tretter, our teacher and advisor throughout this whole year-long research. Okay. Very good, very interesting, very interesting. Um, so if anybody has any questions, they're, they're more than welcome to ask them, anybody at all. I, I actually, I'm, I have a couple of questions that I'll, I'll start off with. Number one, I'm just curious, did they, do you know what kind of gas it's going to use for its thrusters? 
Um, no, we do not. Okay. Not off the top of our heads. Yeah. It's, it's probably it's in a, a paper yeah. somewhere that Dr. Lee has written. Okay. Yeah, cold gas thrusters, but not sure exactly which gas. Yeah, well, it's got to thrust out something, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, and will will you be um? At, so at th at this point, like as of today, where are, are you? Are you done? Kind of you know working with Dr. Lee and Brian, or are you going to continue for the rest of the year, and then maybe and or start up again next year? What, what, what's what's what? Do you have a plan? So we wrote a paper outlining our mission um, that is mostly in the drafting stages at this point. We're working on finalizing it. So we are going to be meeting with um, Dr. Lee and Dr. Day probably again this year a few times to make sure that the paper is where it needs to be um, and then see if like publishing that is something that we can do. Um, other than that, I feel like that is probably all that we're doing with this project. Yeah, it will likely com uh, complete by the end of the year. Okay, great. Well, good job and, and good luck on, on uh, with your paper. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, if anybody else has a question, go just go ahead and unmute yourself. But you should be able to. Hey, can I ask one? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think early on you mentioned something about sinuous rills. Um, can you describe what those are? So they're areas that used to um, have lava within them on the moon and then over time, over billions of years, <laughs> that has gone away and now they're just like these hollow tubes that run along the surface of the moon. And then what we're talking about areas where that has collapsed since it's just hollow inside. Okay. Um, how does that work with the impact melt that you're also seeing there. Are they maybe um, similar looking features that occur in impact melt? So I think that the impact melt generally occurs first when the crater is formed. And then the sinuous rills form from lava flow, um, not necessarily from any volcanic or seismic action, but from that original impact. Sometimes the magma within the moon can rise up and well through. So the way that Dr. Lee was explaining it to us when we were asking him about this was that the impact melt and the sinuous rills can sometimes be formed around the same time, um, except at that point the rills are filled with lava and they're not collapsed or hollow yet. Okay, um, maybe if it's possible you could check out some compositional data to see if you actually <clears throat> see uh, basalt in there. Um, I'm just looking at your figure three I don't know if those are the features you're talking about, but um, those look like they're pretty typical of impact melt fractures rather than a, a lava sinuous roll. But yeah, just maybe something to check out if you get a chance. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Oh, and I just finally found the reactions button. Sorry, I meant to hit like the little clappy thing, but I couldn't find it before when you finished it. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so I'll try to click that for the next one. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, uh, anybody else? Questions or comments? No? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Mount Horror High School. Well done. Um, yeah, good job. <laughs> hope, hope, to, hope to see your paper in, in publication sometime in the next thank year you. or two. <laughs> you can think forever. Thank you very much for having us at the beginning of this. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I believe they also have to jump off now because they got to they gotta get on with their day. So we'll let them do that. Um, so before we get started, uh, starting off with Comac High School, um, does anybody have any questions uh, about today's process? Okay. And uh, Michelle, yes, I did get your, po I got the poster, so we're good, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I believe that's Dominic. 
Yes, hello. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Brandon, you're starting off. We're going out, going in alphabetical order, by the way. I should, I should, I should have mentioned that. If you didn't already know, we're going to just be going in alphabetical by school. So, okay, so Brandon, are you sharing? What are you, are you sharing your poster? Um, I'll be sharing a PowerPoint presentation okay. that I made based off my poster. Okay, very good. All right. Okay, whenever you're ready. Can you see anything? Okay. Um, I want to download it instead. So I'm just going to refresh and try it again. There we go. All right, so my name is Brandon Burkhoff and I investigate in molecular and ice water content in different lunar regions. Recent studies have shown that there have been water ice permanently shaded in different regions of, in uh, the poles of the moon. You can see that here in the North and South Pole. And in addition to that, the Sophia Observatory recently discovered that there is water molecules present in sunlit areas of the moon. So the aim of the study is to determine which regions of the lunar surface may have a higher concentration of both molecular water and water ice using imagery and topography data from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or the LRO. This study will help scientists and engineers determine which regions of the moon are most suitable and resource abundant for future crewed and robotic lunar landing locations. Extracting this water, can, uh, extracting this water will enable scientists to expand lunar research and will allow the moon to be used as a gateway for future deep space missions. Two of the most prominent features of impact craters are central peaks and ejecta blankets. Central peaks form in the center of craters at the moment of impact when the, imp when the energy generated from the impact is so great that the crater, impact the crater collapses in on itself and the ejecta blanket rebounds back or, and the central peak rebounds back up from the crust below. And then ejecta blankets are the debris blown out from the moment of impact, um, a lot like an explosion. And then in addition to that, lobes, which are a feature of ejecta blankets, are which look like um, they look a lot like petals, they are a strong indication of hydrated soil. Studies show that the that the diameter that the ratio between the diameter of the central peak and its respective crater and the ratio between the ejecta blanket radius and its respective crater increase with a more hydrated and ice-rich surface. Regions of the lunar surface that have the highest water content can be investigated further for future lunar landing lunar landing sites. These water molecules and ice can be extracted from the lunar surface and broken down into their key components of water and of hydrogen and oxygen through the process of electrolysis, electrolysis. With hydrogen and oxygen having a, an extremely high specific impulse of up to 460 to 480 seconds, these components can be condensed into their liquid states and used to refuel launch vehicles for future missions into the deep solar system. This led me to my problem, which was to determine by comparison between each other and to other planetary bodies, which region of the moon is the most abundant in molecular and ice and in molecular and molecular and ice water based on crustal strength by analyzing the ratio between crustal central peak diameter to crater diameter and to check the blanket radius to crater radius. So I started by selecting four different regions of the moon based on uh, their geological features, the North Pole, South Pole, a Maria region, and a Highland region. And using a lunar reconnaissance orbiter, wide angle camera, and LOLA elevation labor, lay, layers within JMARS software, craters with diameters mostly above 15 kilometers were identified and their coordinates were recorded. At least 10 craters were selected for each of the regions of interest. And these were randomly selected between all in that region of interest, which had clear central peaks and ejecta blankets. Cross-sectional profiles were placed across each of these craters using LOLA topography layers. And in kilometers, each crater's diameter, central peak diameter, Ejecta blanket radius was and ejecta blanket radius was measured using uh, Microsoft Excel. This process was repeated with three profiles for each crater, each being separated by about 60 degrees. Each of these profile, each of the profiles of the crater diameter, central peak diameters, and ejecta blanket radii were averaged together in Microsoft Excel, and the ratios between all of them were taken. 
unpaired t-tests were done between all of these ratios in Microsoft Excel to determine whether or not these differences were significant. And the ejecta mobility ratios of four lunar regions were compared with each other and then compared to other planetary bodies with known hydration contents. Here's an example of one of the cross-sectional profiles. And here are the four different lunar regions that I analyzed. Here are the, here's my raw, my raw data for the four lunar regions and my charts with my final data. So it was found that the Lunar Maria region had the highest average ratio between the crater diameter and central peak diameter and crater radius and eject the blanket radius, which can be seen with this here. And there wasn't a, a significant statistical difference in the crater radius to eject the blanket radius between the lunar highlands and the lunar north and south poles, nor was there a difference with the crater diameter to central peak diameter between the lunar highlands and the lunar north and south poles. However, there was a significant statistical difference in the crater radius to eject the blanket radius between the Lunar Maria region when compared to the three other regions. And this was clear with their three t-tests. And it's also clear in the graph here. So it was found that the Lunar Maria region had an ejecta mobility ratio very similar to, or much lower than that of the surface of Ceres, which is about a planetary body with a very high known ice content on its surface. However, it's important to note that the gravitational force of Ceres is only about 17% of that of the moon. So it's expected that its ejecta blanket would extend out more, like much further on Ceres. The ejecta mobility ratios of each crater analyzed on the, lunar Maria, on the lunar Maria region falls within the range of the ejecta mobility ratios that was recorded on Ceres. And all the craters analyzed had a much narrower range of values, which indicates that the lunar crust and regolith in the Maria region is more uniform than that of Ceres. The average, the average ejecta mobility ratio in the Maria region of the lunar surface falls very close to the average ejecta mobility ratio found on the Martian surface, which also has a significant ice content known on its surface. The average ejecta mobility ratio of, Mar of craters on the Martian surface is found to be close to that that was analyzed in the lunar Maria region. But since the gravitational field of Mars is more than twice that, that of the moon, it could be expected that its ejecta blanket, that its ejecta mobility ratio Sorry would be higher if Mars had a gravity, if Mars had a higher gravitational force similar to the moon. So these, the Lunar Maria region can be analyzed further using lunar reconnaissance orbiter instruments such as the Lyman Alpha mapping project or the mini RF tech demo, both of which use, are used to search for ice deposits on the lunar surface. However, one of the most significant parts of the study is that the Lunar Maria region is mostly composed of um, uh, volcanic and basaltic rock, which does have a high tensile compressive and fractal strength. It's very brittle, which could have led to more mass being ejected farther in the Maria region than what was observed in four other lunar regions. So when, a, when taking these differences into account, comparing the ejecta mobility ratios of the Maria region to the lunar surface to planetary bodies with known hydration contents could help to confirm whether or not there's water contents on the lunar surface. Here are my references and my acknowledgments. Hey, sorry, the, the one job I had and that was to watch the timer for you when I, I failed. <laughs> very right. first presentation. Well done, good job, thank you very much. Thank okay, you. Uh, any questions, any, anyone? I'll tell you, let's, yeah, well, uh, we'll start with the judges. Any judges have any questions? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I was just kind of curious when you are selecting the craters, um, did you find it relatively easier or harder to identify the ejecta around some of the craters? Um, the ejecta blankets were fairly easy to uh, find. You can see here in the topography layer uh, chart from this crater, and uh, specifically, you could see where the ejecta blanket is just based on elevation. And you can also compare that to, you can't see it in this because this isn't like a real time, um, like an uh, analysis of the crater, but you'd be able to see that the, um, the ejecta blanket ends roughly where you could see, where you can visually see where the ejecta blanket ends in the lunar reconnaissance orbiter image. 
Oh, OK. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's an interesting um, way to look at it. He, the one thing I would just maybe just say as feedback <clears throat> is that uh, that that topographic feature that you're looking at there that stands out so clearly is actually like the rim of the crater. So um, that's not necessarily all of the ejecta. The ejecta is actually gets really thin as you get away from that uh, that far away from the crater. And it doesn't actually really stand out in the topographic profile because it's actually so thin and mixes in uh, with the upper lunar surface. But so I think what you actually might be measuring um, is the rim uh, width, um, mm -hmm. which is which is still a useful parameter though, but um, just the ejecta itself is really hard to pull out of the topography. Okay. I have a quick question. Um, you mentioned uh, molecular and ice water, like you mentioned both of those. I, I just wondered how would you differentiate between the two or like what do you mean when you say those two different terms? So I just, uh, I made a difference between those two because the SOFIA obser uh, observation, which I believe was a couple of years ago, that didn't detect actual ice or they didn't believe it detected ice that was mostly just very, very light traces of water molecules on the surface compared to actual traces of ice in permanently shaded regions. And then how do you think that the, um, the water got there then, if it's not ice? Like, what do you think it is? Um, that could have been from actual impact events such as, or like actual, um, asteroids or meteors hitting, which had traces of water on them. Cool, thanks. Hey, uh, Sarah, any, any questions? Um, not at this moment, but nice job. Thank you. Okay, great. Anybody else uh, on the line with us have any questions? If no one else wants to ask, I wouldn't yeah, go ahead. another. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think I think Kelsey was started to get at this kind of question. Um, I was curious. So your your measurements led you to one conclusion or one theory um, about uh, where you might find the most lunar water, uh, but are there other, like say orbital data sets that might support or maybe say, uh, maybe that might not be the case? <laughs> uh, yes, so as I stated towards the end, there are at least two instruments on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter here that are used to detect traces of ice water and I believe hydrogen. Um, so that order yeah. could have been used. Yeah, well, I mean, they've been finding trace amounts. So like parts per million on average, and that yeah. would just be in the upper surface. Do you think that would be enough water though to affect the shape of a large crater? Um, traces like that, probably not, no. Um, it would be mostly traces of ice, such as those in the uh, North and South Pole but you didn't actually find any different crater shapes there on average in the north and south pole right no we didn't find much of a difference there okay cool thanks of course kind of building off that i just wanted to kind of ask for an elaboration on this conclusion um and that you know you found the significantly different crater morphology in the maria compared to the other three regions so why do you think that is it? Do you think that, that it is the water? Um, and then you've added uh, this, this mention about it being brittle, but like what are the other factors that could have been influencing the crater morphology in the Maria? So I don't believe it's as much the um, water content if there is a significant content there. I think it is mostly the, um, the composition of the crust in the
You drop out. <laughs> Internet. Oh. oh. Drop out. <laughs> oh. Uh, is it better now? Yeah. <laughs> I think we dropped out about 30 seconds ago, though. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'll restart then. So I do think it is mostly the composition of the crust in the Lunar Maria region, which is mostly volcanic basaltic rock. And that is very brittle compared to the rock found in the other three regions we analyzed, which is also much older compared to the, um, the crust of the Maria region. Did you get that or? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> just making sure. Hey, anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you, Brandon. Thanks. Okay, up next is <clears throat> Crumb High School. And are are you sharing your poster or, or am I still doing that? You have the, the new poster if you would share that for him, please. Oh, sure. Let's get that up. Uh, hello. We're not oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so everybody seeing the poster? Yes. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Ready? <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Allison Jennings. This is Caleb Carlos Carlson, and this is Ryan Jeremy. We're from Crumb High School. And we're doing our presentation over ice mining for water supply of moon base. Um, yeah, so let me start off with the intro. For a successful base on the moon, you obviously need um, the basics like water, food, and oxygen. So for our presentation and our, pro our poster, we chose a water supply for a moon base. Um, we researched two different methods of collecting this water. One, um, using shadowed ice craters uh, that have ice in them, and the other using the regolith on the moon um, for collecting ice. So starting off with our first method, our first method will be using Fresnel lenses, which will, they will gather the light and then project the light onto, if you look at figure three, it will, we will shine the light onto our secondary optics chamber where we will have, it will just be a housing unit where then it shines the light and it, it melts the ice and we will collect the water vapor into our cold traps, which will then refreeze the water and we'll have ice haulers that then take it to our secondary site, which is located right next to our base. And our base is gonna be located just outside of our ice craters on the south pole of the moon. And once our ice haulers then, our ice haulers are about the size of a, a buggy with just um, tra with trailers in the back. And once it gets to our secondary site, we will then put it into an ice storage unit. And in that ice storage unit, once it gets, once our ice storage unit gets filled up, we will then put it, it will, all of this is together as well. It will then go to our melting where we melt it again and purify the water of any harmful bacteria, any rocks, anything inside of it. And then we will then transport that clean water to our storage site, which is right next to the place. And for the Fresnel lenses, where we put them 
is going to be right outside the crater so that they can catch the moon or the sun's light and reflect it. So to find where we're going to put it exactly where we put the Fresno lenses, it will be we will send rovers and have orbiters that are taking pictures to get precise measurements of where they need to face and exactly where we want to place them. And after that, we will have exactly where we want our base or the chamber that we have, which the chamber won't be, as you can see in figure four, our chamber isn't gonna be as big as the ice patch. And once we run out of ice on our specific area, we will retake measurements and move the chamber that we have. So with our second method, our second method is going to really be a backup for when we have everything is shaded, we don't have the sun for the Fresno lenses, we will be collecting regolith from from the moon, from the surface, and we will heat that and drill into the ice and place the heated regolith to then melt and collect the water vapor again, refreeze and send it to our ice storage system. This method, our first method, makes roughly 290,000 and 400 gallons of water per year which is roughly 800 gallons per day. And the average human from our research takes, uses around 101.5 gallons of water per day. So we can support around 800 using only this, but with recycling on the base, recycling most of our water, we should be able to get 11 to 12, maybe 13 people on our base. And so the price of this is definitely, it's $1,895 per gallon of water. This is way cheaper, way cheaper. Two minutes. Way, uh, this is way cheaper compared to the alternative, which is shipping up water, where we will have to keep the water still using using baffles and so that the water doesn't slosh around. And from our observations, it takes around, it costs roughly $10,000 per pound to ship stuff up to the moon. And there are roughly eight pounds in a gallon. So it'll cost around $80,000 per gallon versus our $1,895 per gallon to do it on the moon. Uh, we would like to give thanks and acknowledgments to our teacher, Ms. Hardy, and our advisor, Dr. Honable. Yeah, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you. All right, um, zoom out of this little bit. Whoa. <laughs> All right, uh, any questions? Yeah, may, I have, may I ask you? Oh, go ahead. You go first. Oh, okay. Can I have? Uh, so uh, your conclusions. You were talking about how you're going to be making this um, nearly three hundred thousand gallons of water yearly, and you gave a price uh, for the the cost of mining that water. Uh, can you go into some detail about how you derived those numbers? So the way that we got these numbers is really mainly from our references which is a planetary journal that was done about extracting, it wasn't about extracting water, but ex it, well, it extracted, they extracted water so that they could then get hydrogen, so that they could split it and get hydrogen and oxygen, so that they could then fuel the water or fuel rocket ships to go to Mars. So this is where we mainly got that it, they were saying it would cost around this much money per gallon are per uh, megaton to get the hydrogen and we just and we had Dr. Honable helped us out. She did the calculations to get that into how much money it costs per gallon and how much gallons of water we have.
I have a question, um, two questions. So I think you mentioned recycling, like, so one, are, so once you have the water, you're able to just keep on recycling it daily. Um, that's my first question. Second question is, um, assuming that's not what's happening, how long is it gonna be until you run out of water um, by sourcing it from the moon? Like how much is there on the moon to source for this? So where we, when I was doing research and looking at where we wanted to have the ice, which is on the South Pole, we, I found that it said roughly 33%, I think, of the dark craters have ice. Uh, that might be wrong with the percentage, but that, so if our ice crater, which we picked a, well, we will pick a very big ice crater, which has a ton of ice, or a lot of ice, sorry. And once we run out, the, there are ice craters right next to it, right nearby. So we will be able to move all of our stuff just over there. And the recycling question, so for recycling the water, it won't be just instantly recycled. It will still have to be cleaned and redone. And of course you will lose water while doing that, but we will make enough water per day that it should not affect us. And do you have an estimate for like how long it would be until that first crater gets consumed? Like, are you going to be able to stay at the first crater for years or days or? Um... We don't have a full estimate of, we, we do not have an estimate of how long the first ice crater will be. We will more than likely choose a big enough ice crater that it will last a couple of years, but I, I do not have a... Okay, yeah, a couple of years. That's like, thanks, yeah, that was, answers my question. Thank you. Um, I've got a question. So with 800 gallon of water per day per person, how much of the moon's regolith you have to process to be able to get that much water? I do not know how much regolith we will have to process per day to get enough water for that but the regolith will just, we will heat it and then that's what melts the ice. So we'll still be melting the ice and then we just keep reheating the regolith. So I'm guessing all this process is robotic. You have robotic equipment doing this and uh, um, as far as um, storing the water as well. So um, the way that I can see it is that, that your robotic equipment goes from one crater to another, to another to do this and uh, have you taken into account uh, how to transport water from one creator to another and the where to store it and all? Yes, we will, the water will be stored where we will have just tanks where usually on a moon base, you will also still have tanks where you store your water. This is also where we will, we'll just move the water over there and it will just have big storage units to story. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Julie, do you have any questions? Um, no, I think the other questions covered it for me. Thanks. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Chrome High School. All right, up next is the Logos Charter School in Oregon. And are you all sharing a PowerPoint or your poster? Well, we will be sharing a PowerPoint. Okay. So let me just pull it up here. All right. And then can everybody see that okay? Yep. Yes, awesome. All right. Awesome. Maybe turn down your just a little bit. Uh, one second here. All right. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jalen Hensley. And my name is Asher Molder. Our mentor is Holly Bensel, and we're from Logos Public Charter School in Medford, Oregon. And the topic of our research is the comparison of known lunar pits using the Iraq Quick Map tool. 
With increased interest in building a permanent habitat on the moon, lunar pits may provide the necessary resources used to sustain life. These pits, which are often formed by the collapse of lava tubes, can provide shelter from extreme temperature variations, radiation, and micrometeorites. Additionally, water ice, a vital resource for exploration, may also be present within these pits. And our goal was to analyze about 10% of the known pits on the moon to determine if there was any correlation between their mineralogy, locations, and general geographic features. The majority of pits are formed by collapsed lava tubes. However, especially for impact melt pits, they can just be a void that is collapsed by seismic or meteorite activity. Lava tubes and pits were recently discovered using the lunar orbiter images. In 2009, the first pit was confirmed through images by the Kaguya spacecraft. Since then, more than 300 lunar pits have been cataloged using a computer algorithm that scanned thousands of high resolution images of the lunar surface from the LRO narrow angle camera. The majority of these pits were located in the lunar maria or large craters with impact melt ponds. As you can see from the image, pits have been found in a variety of areas. All three types of pits, mar, highland, and impact flow melt are marked. And pits have been found to occur in younger geologic areas spread across the face of the moon. And as of 2021, scientists have discovered roughly 281 pits and melt deposits of impact craters, 15 pits in mar basalts, and five pits in non-impact melt highland terrain. And there are three types of pits. There's flow melts, highland, and mare pits. Flow melt and highland pits had smaller diameters ranging from five to 40 meters, while mare pits were over 100 meters. Flow melts were typically elliptical, while mare pits were more circular, and highland pits met in the middle at an oval shape. The terrain surrounding the pits affects the geological makeup as well as the sizes and shapes. And the formation mechanism for pits in mar and impact melt is likely similar, according to Wagner. Pits in the mar may have formed when a portion of a lava tube collapsed. This forms more circular pits. As you can see on the image to the left, a natural bridge is formed by the side by the collapse of nearby sections of a lava tube. This is a feature in an impact melt pond. The image on the right is Marius Hill Pit showing the large void opening and a buried lava field in a mare. During the creation of an impact melt, the thickness of the molten rock varies. When the melt is thick enough, the top layer cools first as the layers below it continue to flow. Therefore, a gap is left underneath the newly formed layer. Later, a portion of the surface collapses, leaving the irregular shaped pit and fractures that we see in this image. They formed after the melt due to various circumstances. Our methods are as follows. Study the moon's surface using a uh, quick map tool is provided. Choose approximately 10% of the pits on the moon and analyze pits from each geologic terrain. Study and compare known surface features of said lunar pits, and then collect data and organize said data into spreadsheets. The data collected includes geologic location, the age period, topographic profile, the chemical and mineral abundance, the pit diameter, and flow melt pond diameters. And seen here is the method used to get the average diameter of the pits. We took four separate lines and went from one side to the exact opposite. We then averaged the length of these lines to get our average diameter. These lines are also what we used for the pit profile data. To aid our research, we chose to color code our spreadsheet. Blue represents mar pits, orange represents flow melts, and green represents highland pits. Across the tops, we have labels for columns of data we wanted to find. We have other data sheets shown below. And we thought perhaps pits would show a disturbance in the mineral makeup around the pit. Thus, looking at mineralogy maps could guide us to a pit if we saw a particular disturbance, but this did not happen. In this figure, you can see the mineral data does not extend past positive 50 or negative 50 degrees latitude. This makes it much more difficult to gauge what minerals the pits contain, especially in the polar regions. And due to the limitations of the Kaguya and Lunar Prospector data, it is harder to see the abundance of certain elements in the pits. In the figures, you can see the area covered by each pixel of the overlay is too large to get an accurate enough reading. Despite Kaguya being better than Lunar Prospector, it is still not high enough resolution for the smaller pits. And we also discovered that lunar pits occurred more commonly in younger geologic areas more often than others. According to Wagner, pits are a young feature on the moon. Wagner said impact melt ponds of Copernican craters are some of the younger terrains on the moon. Pits are common in impact melts of Copernican age craters. For example, King and Copernicus craters with two of the highest pit concentrations are both roughly 1 billion years old. Maria and Highland craters are younger looking with sharp, well-defined edges, despite the Maria being 3 billion years old and the Highlands even older. In these latter terrains, it is suggested that if the craters formed earlier in time, they would be destroyed by meteorite bombardment. With this knowledge, we can focus our search into younger geologic areas for a higher chance of pit occurrence. We expected that there would be a range in the size of impact flow melt ponds that would or wouldn't produce pits. 
This would allow us to focus our search in regions with specific sized ponds. Our results indicate that pits were found in a wide range of impact, impact flow melt ponds, though they appear to be more common in impact melts of Copernican H craters that are at least 10 kilometers in diameter. And when attempting to get profiles of the pits, there were unexpected results from the Lola data. The expectation was to have the profiles look like a pit as seen here. However, the majority of the pit's profiles look like the next slide, flat with no indication of elevation depth. This made it extremely difficult to analyze pit depths and determine a trend. We hypothesize that the reason you don't get a pit looking profile is because the majority of the pits were too small for the resolution of the LOLA data, which is proving every 100 meters. Our pit diameters were much smaller than this, meaning the profiles did not look as expected. There are likely many undiscovered pits. We did not find any correlations in our data with pits. We can only say what terrain was more likely to have it. Lighting and distortion of the lunar map near the poles and accuracy of the various tools when dealing with small features makes finding additional pits difficult. According to Wagner, the LRO mission has only imaged about 40% of the moon with appropriate lighting for the successful automated pit searching program. This means that there could be roughly 450 plus pits waiting to be discovered. And based on our collected data, areas of interest, as well as potential new pits were found. The target areas we would focus on are fractured flow melt ponds found in Copernican geological terrain. Without more advanced tools than those we use on our rock quick map, we cannot prove if our potential pit was a pit, a shadow, or a crater. The only way to truly know the usefulness or existence of a pit is to have a physical study before humans rely on them. Drones and robots designed to study subterranean features on the moon could be sent ahead of humans to scout the nature of these voids. Thank you for listening to our presentation. My name is Asher Molzer. And I'm Jalen Hensley. And we're from Logos Public Charter School. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now we'll um, take some, some questions. From our, we'll start with our judges again. I can ask one. Awesome. Can turn it up a little bit more? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so you picked 10% of the pits uh, to study so you wouldn't have to do them all. Um, but later you found out that the resolution um, might have been an issue if a pit was smaller than 100 meters. So I'm just wondering, could you have picked only pits that were greater than 100 meters or like how many pits are of that size? Um, we, just, we found that uh, only the Mar pits uh, or the pits located in the Maria were above 100 meters, and there was a very small uh, data set of those. And so, to get a larger data set, like from Flow Mount and Highland areas, we would have to choose the smaller pits. And if there are, and there there could possibly be larger pits in Flow Mounts, but they would be outliers. They would not be what the general pits in that area would be like. And they still wouldn't be close to 100 meters. And so, if we would have just done the larger pits, we would have little to no data collected for Highland and flow melt yeah. pits. Okay, and why is it that the pits are bigger in the, the Mare? We're unsure. It seems to be that the terrain. The, the terrain affects it. It's a lot more flat. It's less, you know. And they have a bigger lava tube. And, and yeah, yeah it, it depends on the lava tubes and how it formed as well. If the lava tube is larger, then you have the much greater chance of having a larger skylight or pit. Whereas for the flow melt, it's, you know, you have smaller, voids essentially yeah. yeah the flow melts are more likely to fracture in small sections compared to the mar yeah okay thank you thank you okay go ahead yeah go ahead <laughs> okay. um yeah yeah thanks um yeah i really enjoy listening to your talk um i did just want to like kind of follow up on one thing that you mentioned um, related to the younger terrain and the pits being younger features. Mm -hmm. um, I think the way you stated it, it sounded like you um, were implying that the pits are only found in Copernican terrain. Is that correct? Um, not only Copernican terrain, the flow melt pits were largely found in Copernican terrain to uh, craters. And so those are obviously younger features. And then, but for the majority of Mar and Highland pits, they were not found in those areas. They were, like they were in More the Imbrian age, Imbrian which is still age. younger, but definitely not super young. Um, and so, but 
because those ages are older and the pits look so much more defined and younger features that if they formed close to the formation of the Maria or the Highlands, we feel they would they wouldn't be there today due to you know erosion or uh, lunar bombardment that would just kind of take them out. You want to, anything to that? Um, yeah, I was going to say, um, and the reason we had so many more younger ones is because for the older ones, like he was saying, erosion, um, bombardment and things, meteorites, collapses, anything that could have splashed into these pits. So they were more likely to be filled in um, more so than the younger ones that were in the Copernican age. There he is. There is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing maybe to keep in mind is that um, the pits themselves can be a geologically young occurrence. So like, yeah, they're pretty fresh. Uh, they have steep, sharp morphology. They, you know, they have a lot of detail yeah. to them. But they can occur in older terrains and like the mare deposits. So they don't necessarily... The unit that they form in doesn't have to be young, it sounds like, right? Yeah. Um, so it's the difference between a young feature and a young terrain. Yeah, yeah, it, yes. <laughs> we just found that to help solidify the younger nature of the pits, they were also found in generally younger terrains. So well, yes, they are very young features because of, their morphology and everything, it just helped to solidify that kind of hypothesis that the majority of these pits were found in younger terrain. Thank you for your insight on that. We appreciate it. Yeah, no, I definitely see where you're going with the impact craters. Like, so an older impact crater would have more degraded deposits. So um, th those collapses probably would have happened longer in the past, right? And so they're, they're degraded now and you just don't see them. Yeah. Um, but the, the Mare pits are interesting because I think they're still telling us that those lava tubes are still around and still collapsing even now. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, if you thought that there were more lunar pits left to be discovered on the moon, where would you send a mission to look? Or, and what instrumentation would you think would be most beneficial to help find new tubes? Um, I mean, there's not a whole lot of definitive data as to exactly like what mineral distribution or uh, geologic areas that pits rely in, or lie in, I should say. We did find that they were more in there was a high density in the Copernican aged craters. So probably to find more pits, we would look in those younger geologic areas or due to LROC not mapping the uh, North Pole and South Pole very accurately um, or the polar regions very accurately. Um, we could also send missions up there with probes or you know drones to help yeah. discover pits that we can't see from Earth because they're permanently shadowed, but with some other higher accuracy, closer detailed a drone, we could see them instead. And yeah, kind of what he was saying with the poles, because due to the fact that there is no data for the poles or not high enough resolution, um, sending a mission with the, the free flying spacecraft as, we sh as shown on the second to last slide, as you can see here, um, I think that would be the perfect technology to be sent up into the poles to explore possible pit locations. Awesome, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> I've got a quick question on this yeah. topic uh, of, this, of this drone, for example. How would a drone on the moon, or over the moon, if you will, how, how would a drone at the moon, how would that differ from like the, um, the helicopter uh, that's flying over our Ingenuity helicopter. It's on Mars right now. How, how would those two things differ? I think the biggest difference would possibly be the size and the makeup of it, because we'd want to make this spacecraft smaller so that it can explore narrower areas compared to a bigger piece of technology that's more limited and 
maybe not able to deal with possible pressure underneath the surface of the moon? Also, there's a less, much less atmosphere on the moon, so it makes it harder to get any lift when you're, when you have any flying craft up there. So would you have to have like ginormous blades? You either have to have ginormous blades or rockets of some court, some sort, if that technology gets accurate enough, or just more blades, kind of just I think, in general. I think more, I think more blades would be. You would just need more blade easier. surface area in general. More blades would be better than bigger blades, well, just for me, the case so that it could go into smaller areas. Okay, let me follow up on that. So um, if uh, hypothetically you could actually get uh, a helicopter to fly, uh, would there be any advantage to use a helicopter over a rover? Um, by rover, do you mean something that can't fly, I, I assume? Right, yeah. like exactly yeah, okay. what you have, yeah. Like exactly okay. what you have on the slide, yeah. Okay, um, I, I think the advantage to having something that could fly would be ease of access to the pits. You know, since it is an overhang into a tube, it would be harder for a rover of some get sort out. to get out or get in to rappel down or out. Um, whereas, you know, some flying craft could kind of make its way down there without having to be attached to anything surrounding it. And also, if there happened to be anything flowing through any of the tubes that it was exploring, it could hover above versus driving through it. So do you think the scientific yield would be worth the cost to justify the cost? I believe so, yes. I believe so as well. Because pits could provide a lot of necessary resources to aiding further research and exploration of the moon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. That was cool. All right, our final presentation for today at North County High School, Maryland. Hello. Oh, sorry, there you are. <laughs> there was <laughs> all the camera feed move around. Okay, uh, uh, okay, so let me share your poster. Okay. Okay. Whenever you're ready, Dominic. Awesome. Uh, everyone can hear me, right? All right, cool. So my project was focused on possible causes of hydration on uh, asteroid 4 Vesta, um, and specifically a crater called Opia. So Vesta is the second largest asteroid in the asteroid belt behind Ceres. Um, and we've known for a long time that Ceres is um, icy. It's hydrated, contains quite a bit of water. Vesta, however, is largely considered pretty dry. Um, and one of the exceptions to this is a crater called Opia. And it's not really well known, but it sits along uh, the southern side of a very deep depression in Vesta. It's a spheroid. It's a very imperfect uh, spheroidal shape. but to the south of this depression is Opia Crater. And two of the main interesting things about it are that its ejecta blanket sits only to mostly one side, and it actually contains a pretty strong hydration feature. Um, and so the main questions that we had when going into this project were, well, what is the source of that hydration feature? And how is it applicable elsewhere to our solar system? And I don't think it needs to be restated that um, water is vital in understanding our solar system as well as other solar systems. We think of the water chain on Earth and how water moves through, but actually it applies to our solar system too as well. There's a water cycle to our solar system. Um, it may have been more active in the past with uh, more heavier bombardments, but we don't think that Vesta is a very hydrated body, but this is an exception, so we ought to look into it. And the way that we did that is through um, using previous data sets from the Dawn mission that visited uh, Vesta about a decade ago. So mainly it was through the VIR instrument, which is the visual and infrared uh, spectrometer um, instrument that was on Dawn. And so we looked specifically at the area around Opia in the 2.8 micron absorption band. And what that means is that 2.8 microns is within the mid infrared range and it is the strongest, I believe, absorption band at which uh, hydroxyl and water molecules absorb that light. Um, and so that's light that is um, 
being reflected to Vesta from the sun and re-emitted and detected through this instrument. And that's the light band that is absorbed by it. We also looked into uh, hydrogen neutron abundance. Um, so this is cosmic and solar sources of neutrons that go to Vesta's surface and are slowed down and moderated by Vesta and then reflected back to the neutron device on dawn. And so what we actually found is when we drew surface plots, just straight lines from Opia's um, ejecta blanket to its center, we found that it's actually strongly correlated with the elevation of the crater. Um, our hydration feature increases along the elevation of the crater. And that's not so much the case with our hydrogen abundance. And to be clear, the hydrogen abundance is hydrogen counts that exist within the first several meters of soil, regolith rather, while our hydration feature in the 2.8 micron absorption band is closer to an order of millimeters. And we found that indeed um, the ejected blanket does have a hydration feature, but the outer crater rim doesn't. And as I said, the lower seated hydration is not as strong. And so what that suggests is that it was actually a hydrate impactor. Um, you'd expect with an endogenous source of hydration that the ejecta blanket and the area around it would actually have sort of a uniform hydration um, from surface to deeper because the material that was impacted was also hydrated, but that's not what we see. What we see is that the material that covers the outermost surface of the regolith has the hydration feature. So that suggests that this region was not hydrated prior to the impact event, but it was only later on that a hydrated impactor formed the ejecta and opia crater, as well as this hydration feature. Um, so further modeling, impact modeling could definitely um, further elaborate because the data that was worked with here is from um, a mission that came as a flyby. It, I don't think it did many orbits if it did at all, but um, the, the, the data here, it was hard to work with, with on, but we were able to um, get it into JMAR software and manipulate it through there. So our hydration counts were um, for the 2.8 absorption band were all unitless. They were converted to grayscale. And what that gives you is intensity. The hydrogen abundance, however, was represented in uh, micrograms per gram. Um, so I'd just like to take a quick opportunity to remind you that um, finding out the sources of hydration in our solar system is very important. Um, there's a big difference between a hydrated feature coming originally from the formation of a body versus it being brought elsewhere. And that's an important difference to establish. Um, as for the ejecta blanket being only to one side of Opia Crater, um, well, the most common impact angles are actually about 45 degrees. So we found the most likely explanation for this feature is that a hydrated impactor hit a non-hydrated surface and formed a hydrated ejecta to one side because of its impact angle. Um, so I'd just like to thank Dr. Parvathy Prem of the Applied Physics Lab for helping uh, me along the way, being a mentor, helping with uh, editorial contributions, as well as Dr. Zeilenhofer for recommending JMARS to, uh, to my team. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Dominic. <clears throat> okay, let's take uh, questions from our judges. Real quick, I'll just apologize. Uh, my computer's not liking me right now, and it's whatever. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Julie. Hey, yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you a follow up on the reason why the ejectum um, is concentrated on one side of the crater. Um, so you mentioned a low impact angle could explain that. Um, there's actually maybe another explanation um, looking at uh, the topography that you presented here. Uh, did you, is there any reason why you didn't suggest topography being an effect? Um, another suggested effect may have been a, a non homogeneous impactor, you know, it not being made up of a uniform material and then the ejector from that side perhaps being more hydrated, but um, we did not heavily look into topography other than just looking into the elevation, um, less so geology or material or anything related to that. 
Okay, well, Andy very cruelly took your poster down, so um, it's hard to point at it right now, but um, it looked like uh, the, the crater had impacted into something that had a steep slope to it. Um, so like one side of the crater is much higher uh, than the other rim of the crater. Um, yeah, the, the, the lower of the three images there. So the, the one rim is up at green and yellow and uh, the other rim where the ejecta seems to be is a lower rim. Um, and that can actually have an effect on how ejecta leaves the crater. If one rim is a lot easier for it to get out, <laughs> for example. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for pointing that out. I didn't realize that till just now, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I had a question about um, just about the hydration feature. I'm just wondering, like, what exactly does it correspond to, and and how is it being mapped out? Um, and and your grayscale values, like, what is that? How does that relate to that feature or the material? Right. So the the 2.8 absorption band is the most strongly absorbed band of infrared light by water or hydroxyl, just on a molecular level. Um, so in a grayscale representation, it's simply telling intensity. Um, and we derived the data sets from, I believe, um, Icarus et al., um, who did work into looking at this area of VESTA in that um, band range. And so intensity being, like, how does that correspond to the 2.8, like, just Spectrally. Right, so it's 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 not an abundance necessarily. It's more of the the um, I believe the depth of the band, and therefore the amount of light absorbed within that band. Great, thank you. Just a quick one for me. How many points did you take um, to look at the the absorption feature, the two point eight micron absorption feature? How many spots did you look at? Um, so we mainly focused on two regions. I believe the, the, the coordinates are posted along some of the caption lines, but we focused mostly on the northwestern of the crater. Um, we also looked more towards the western as well. Um, I think up towards the, the top in figure A is, is a line uh, where that, the points were taken. Um, the, the number of points, I'm not sure how it's represented in JMARS. I don't know if it's simply point A, point B, and uh, everything along the way. Um, but it was just a, a straight line um, profile. Awesome, thanks. Okay, uh, any other questions? <clears throat> Sorry about the poster disappearing. I was, I, I wanted- It's completely to, fine. I wanted to get- <laughs> PDF to start behaving, or Adobe, I guess. Okay, any other questions? 